All right, we are live. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are super excited this October. This literally is our biggest month we've ever done. We say that every month, but it's true every month. We always try and bring more amazing things to classrooms like you guys. And so this month, by the 31st, we will have done over 60 sessions with amazing researchers, engineers, astronauts, and more from around the world. And we're highlighting, push, highlighting people that are pushing the boundaries of space exploration and understanding. So right now we've got four classes joining us from across North America. So I'm gonna give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. We've got Mr. H's class, grade fives in Canton in Michigan. Hi guys. Hey, we got some mic issues today, but they're there and they're excited. <laughs> we've got Miss Umeda's grade sixes in Punahou, Hawaii. Welcome in guys. Hey, and I hope I pronounced that fairly okay. <laughs> we've got Miss Greer's grade sixes in Mono in Ontario. Hi guys. Hey! So excited, we just need to get out of our seats, apparently. Uh, and last but not least, Miss Fiori's grade threes in Freehold in New Jersey. Hi, guys. Hey! Awesome. All right. Of course, the reason you guys are all joining us is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Waimea, Hawaii, by Daniel DeVoe. He is the Director of Science Operations at the Canada-France-Hawaii Joint Telescope Project which again, explores some amazing parts of the universe. I don't want to spoil it, so I'll leave it over to him and understand a little bit more about what this amazing facility does, what the telescope does, and why they're doing such a fantastic astronomy research in Hawaii on Mauna Kea, one of the most amazing mountains in the world to begin with. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Daniel, and take it away. Should be unmuted now. Good, yeah. go for it. Okay, thank you, Jesse. So thanks everyone for coming. So uh, I'm an astronomer here uh, at the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope. And as Jesse said, my name is Daniel Debo. So right now I'm in Waimea on the Big Island, for those of you who know it. But don't worry, I'll show you what it, where it is. Um, and I'm in the what we call the remote observing room, so which is uh, the room where the observer last night was gathering data and operating the telescope. So this is one of the features of our telescope is that we're, we're completely remotely operated. So it means there's nobody at the summit. And at night, everything happens from down here. So let me share my slides. Let me open my slides. There you go. So you see it, Jesse? You're set. You're great. Perfect. OK, so let's get going. So today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, finding the killer asteroids and a little bonus that we get uh, when we do these searches is sometimes we get visitors from other stars. So I won't tell you uh, much more right now. Uh, so basically at CFHD, we're involved in some kind of a, a program, uh, which is actually a very big participation from the University of Hawaii to find potential impactors, uh, means asteroids that are gonna hit uh, the Earth. So uh, before I get going, uh, let me just first uh, introduce the observatory. So we're in Hawaii, so right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So here's the archipelago, the different islands. And you see on the red circle, this is the big island. So this is where we're at. So like I said earlier, we do operate uh, remotely uh, from there in Waimea. So this is where I am uh, right now. And here, this is the summit of Mauna Kea. So this is where the observatory is. And we have uh, basically an optical fiber link between the two, and we operate everything remotely uh, using the internet, basically. Uh, the internet really allowed us uh, to enable these uh, capabilities. So here's the summit of Mauna Kea with all the telescopes in there. The one circled in red is uh, CFHT. There's 13 telescopes total up there. And here's uh, the telescope uh, in all its splendor uh, and open. So you notice one thing I would like to uh, for you to understand, it's really important to understand parts of this talk, is that you see in the background here, uh, there are star trails, right? You're familiar with these pictures. This is when you take a camera and you point it at the North Star. Somebody did that. And you take what we call a long exposure, meaning that you open the shutter and you take a picture for a long time. So what happens when you do that, you can see star trails. So if 
we were to take pictures like that, all the stars would look like trails in our pictures. Of course, we do not do that. So what you need to do is to follow the motion of the Earth so that you don't have uh, star trails. So keep that in mind. I will come back uh, a little later. So now let's go inside the observatory. So this is the telescope itself. It is a 3.6 meter telescope. So it's not the biggest one, of course, but this is uh, today and today's standard, this is kind of an average size uh, telescope. So the building itself is five story tall. So it's pretty big. And here you can see uh, three members uh, of our day crew. So we have guys that go up every day and fix whatever needs fixing uh, on the telescope. So here you see three of them. So it's really a, a, big, uh, a big structure. So in astronomy, when you want to do science, you use instruments, right? And here at CFHT, we have five of them. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will talk to you today about one particular one. It's the first one on this list. It's called Megacam, and I will give you its characteristics. So astronomer, uh, uh, sorry, I'll give you its characteristics a little later. Uh, one thing is that astronomers really like to give uh, names to their uh, instruments. And these are, you know, acronyms from whatever the instrument does. So our five instruments are called Megacam, Wircam, Espadon, Citel, and Spiru. So like I said, I won't go over all three of them, but these two here are regular cameras, basically. So what we do is take a picture of the sky. This is literally what we do. Of course, it's a very special uh, camera. So here it is. Uh, so Megacam is a six meter tall camera. So for... Uh, <clears throat> You guys in the U.S., that's about uh, a little less than 20 feet tall. So it is a big camera, and it has 377 megapixels. So if you want to compare with uh, today's units uh, for the number of pixels, uh, and it's the same pixels that you have uh, with the cameras on your phone, basically. And it can take pictures that are approximately, you see one on the right, uh, four times the size of the moon. So it's a uh, for, um, for astronomy, this is pretty big. So here we call that the field of view. So when you have a camera and you take a picture, there's a certain field of view that comes with it. And if you, if you take pictures yourself and you look at the picture you took, it's a field of view, right? For regular cameras, it, this, the field of view is really big compared to what we do in astronomy. Because if, if, I don't know if you've ever taken a picture of the moon with your camera, but you see the moon is pretty tiny on a, a regular camera picture. But for us, it's, it's really a smaller field. But in astronomy, a field of four times the size of the moon is, is considered big. So yeah, that's, and it takes, oh yeah, and it takes pictures, one last thing, in optical light. So we can take pictures in, in different uh, regions of the spectrum, which is different colors. And this uh, camera takes pictures of uh, some of the light that you can see uh, with your eyes. So we call that the optical. So, all right, before we uh, go starting about uh, talking about hunting asteroids, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of orbits. So what is an orbit exactly? And uh, uh, how, how, what kind of orbits we have? So here's, here are the orbits of Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. And you've, I'm sure you've seen those. Of course, these rings do not exist. They're not real. Uh, what these rings show is the path of the planet around the sun. So you have the sun that's here in the middle. And uh, let's see, yeah. So do you see the pointer, uh, Jesse? Yes, I do. Sorry about that. Just needed to okay, do. that's okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure. So you have the sun right here, and you have here the way Mercury goes around the sun. You see that it's not perfectly centered. And you see Venus here, how way it goes around, and the Earth, and Mars. And uh, these are not circles, although they look like a circle. They're called ellipses. So they have a, those have a really small, what we call ellipticity. Now, if you look at an asteroid, and here's what I have is 3,200 feet phaeton, which is an asteroid I'm going to talk to you about later. That's one that's well known. So you can see that its orbit is much more elongated 
It's much more elliptical. And that's, that's characteristics of these bodies. Uh, the, their orbit is very different from the orbit of Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury, and all the planets. So here's a little video that will show you the three, because there's a third dimensionality to orbits too. So they're not always exactly lining up. So you can see here, uh, let me replay it again, that uh, they are in fact not aligned with each other. So you, when, you, when you travel the camera through the orbit, you can see here that the orbit of Mercury and Venus are tilted with respect to each other. And you can see also that the orbit of uh, 3,200 feet is very tilted. So again, that's another characteristic of these bodies is that uh, they have orbit with a high inclination. So that's how we call it. The inclination of these orbits is uh, high. So here's another example of orbits. And this one is a pretty interesting one. I won't spend too much time on that. It's not related to asteroids, but it's just Kuiper Belt objects, uh, something that's uh, being uh, investigated right now by uh, many astronomers. And this is the justification for Planet Nine. So if we look at all these uh, purple orbits, they're all bodies of the Kuiper Belt object that we know. And you can see their orbits are all toward one side. So astronomers um, concluded that there's got to be another planet to counterbalance all that and it's called Planet Nine, and we've been looking for it for quite a while, and we haven't found it yet. And uh, we looked for it here at CFHD and couldn't find anything. So anyway, that's just a little, uh, a little side note on how orbits are used in astronomy. So all right, now that you know uh, everything about orbits, let's see uh, exactly what we're dealing with. So here again uh, is, are the orbits of the Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. And the green dots on this picture are, uh, uh, represent an asteroid in the asteroid belt. And they're not threatening for it. They go among their own orbit and they just do their thing. And the, the likelihood of them colliding hurt is, is almost no, uh, zero. Now those red dots here, they're the ones, and the yellow ones, they're the ones that could collide with her. That they're, so they're, uh, potential impactors. So here's a little zoom in on the Earth orbit here and the Venus orbit and the Mercury orbit. So again, Mercury goes around that circle in one year, Venus goes around in one year, and the Earth goes around in one year. And these dots also have their own orbits. So that's at one point in time, that's where these objects are located. And you can see there's a lot that cross that are close to the Earth, Earth's orbit. So there's thousands of them. So here's what it looked like in reality. I uh, apologize for the low quality of this picture, but uh, you have again the orbits and these faint uh, line, blue lines are orbits of these asteroids that I just showed you. So again, you can see that uh, several of them, uh, all of them can uh, cross the Earth, Earth's path. So what can we do about it, right? I mean okay, there's asteroids that can hit us. So the best we can do right now is characterize the orbits of as many objects as possible and see if they will collide with Earth in the future. So we use computers in order to project if the asteroid is gonna collide with Earth in the future. But in order to do that, we need to have a precise characterization of the orbit. And this is where uh, telescopes like CFHD uh, come into play. So I will explain that to you a little more. So I, I like to call it, it's not an official name, but I guess it's my name. I call it the Hawaii uh, Early Warning System. So it's literally what it is. We're trying, trying to look for potential impactors and we find all sorts of things. And so far, so far so good. <laughs> we haven't found one, but some are really close as you will see. So just a little bit of, a, 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 of a, to give you an idea on the scale of these things. So something that's 600 meters uh, bi uh, uh, big, which is a, a radius, and that uh, is, uh, let's see, it's 18, it's, I can't remember what it is in feet, um, multiplied by three, right? So 18, so 1800, 
feet in the uh, diameter. Uh, that's pretty big, and that's global destruction. So if something of 600 meters hit us, uh, that's a global event, and it's like we're going to end up like the dinosaurs. Uh, 160 to 800 meters, then countrywide destruction. 60 to 20 meters region, regional damage, so a city, uh, maybe bigger than a city, 20 to 80 meters in size, citywide damage, and 10 to 30 meters localized damage, and less than 10 meters, it's a visible fireball. So, and we see those, those uh, when they come in, you see them, you see those fireballs, and they burn, burn up in the atmosphere. So we work with another telescope that's located on Maui, and it's called PanStars. So PanStars is really an awesome camera, and it is really built to find those asteroids. So it's a 1.8 meter telescope, so it's a smaller than CFHT, but it's a smaller telescope than CFHT, and it's built on Haleakala uh, on Maui. It operates there. And here's uh, the characteristics of its camera. So again, it, it takes pictures, but th that camera is, is really big, and it's really uh, uh, top top science class uh, camera. So it takes uh, pictures that are nine times the size of Megacam pictures. So here I just put them all 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 together, put uh, one Megacam picture, uh, uh, replicated it nine times, and that's more or less the field of view that you get uh, with PanStars. So that's ideal for hunting asteroids because you want to have a big field of view to catch them. And uh, they're 1 .4, it's a 1.4 gigapixel camera, and it can take images of the whole sky uh, four times a month. So that, that's pretty impressive. So like I was saying, PanStar first finds the new asteroids, and then we follow them up. So here's what uh, asteroids look like. Uh, that's a movie of several images. So as I was telling you earlier, we don't have star trails in like in the background picture here because we're following the motion of the stars. However, asteroids do not move the same way as stars do. So an asteroid will look like that in an astronomy picture is that it'll, it'll look like something that goes off on its own and not follow the star, stellar movements. So here's the real thing is here's what it looks like on a picture, so that's uh, Tutatis, an asteroid that I'm going to talk to you about a little later. That's a really big one. That's the biggest one, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. So you see that trail here. That's a uh, that's an asteroid, basically, and all the stars are around. So we're with the telescope, we're following the movement of the stars, and then if something doesn't go along with the stars, then it gives a trail, and for us, that's an asteroid. That's how we detect them. However, once you've detected them, uh, you're not there yet. You need to uh, follow it up to understand better its orbit. So here, if you bear with me, I'm going to explain to you that graph quickly. So here's the actual orbit of the um, asteroid. And when we first look at it, when PanStar discovers it here, we know where it is, but within this uncertainty. So the error bars, we call them. And then when CFHT follows it up, we have a second point of its trajectory. So now the error bars are smaller. And then a third time, the error bars get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. The more often you observe it, the more accurate you can determine its orbit and the better you will know if it'll impact the Earth or not. And you'll see that uh, sometimes you need a pretty high precision, so that needs a, means a lot of observations. So, all right, so just a couple of examples of uh, known potentially as artists as asteroids, PHAs, so astronomers love to uh, uh, put everything in acronyms. So I'm going to talk to you about Tutatsis, the one I talked to you about earlier, 3200 Phaetum, and Apophis, which is a very interesting one. So here's a picture, a, a rendering of Tutatsis. So uh, there's a couple of things to say there. First, that motion is made up. So this is a motion that I put into the movie and it's made up, it's not real, it doesn't move like that. And the surface also is made up. So I tried to get it close to what an asteroid is, but it's not a real, uh, the real surface, but it's pretty close to it. So here's what it, uh, here's its orbital characteristics. So you don't really need to know that, but this are, these are the numbers we use to uh, know if it will collide with the Earth or not. 
and its main diameter is 5.4 kilometers. So uh, that's about, uh, I don't think, three, three and a half miles or something like that. So it's, it's really big. And if it impacts the Earth, that's total destruction. I mean, that's uh, a dinosaur-like heaven. So here is a graph. I apologize for that, but that's the best way I could uh, uh, explain that. So here is the lunar distance of Tutatis with respect here to the date. So like I was telling you, we observe, we use the models, we use computers to calculate the trajectory over time. And you can see that its closest approach was in 2004, September 29, and it was four times the distance to the moon. So that's really how it works. We calculate that distance, and if it gets too close, then you know we start to panic. We push the panic button. So here's another one, 3200 Phaetum. So that's the one that I showed you its orbit earlier, mean diameter 5.1 kilometer, so still a big impactor. And you can see here the lunar distance as a function of time. So in 2093, it will be seven times the distance uh, from the Earth to the moon. So that's not too bad. So that's okay, we can live with that. So we know where it goes. It's really important to know where they go. So there's the last one, Apophis, which is another rendering of it. And uh, here, its mean diameter is about two, 325 meters. So it's still pretty big. It could be uh, uh, regional damage. And uh, what is wrong with this picture, right? In uh, 2029, April 13, it will come within 0.1 lunar distance of the Earth. That is pretty close. That is uh, scary close. <laughs> so you need to understand exactly how it goes. And that's where the observations and the computer models help us to figure out that number. So we need to have pretty small error bars in order to make sure it doesn't hit the earth or you know, try something if we think it will. So there's a couple of famous flybys. So here, uh, Apophis here is here. Uh, there's the Earth here and the Moon here, and uh, you can see here that dotted line. That's the altitude of the geosynchronous communication satellites. So that satellites are used for cell phones and things like that, and these are the farthest away, uh, TV signals, you name it, and it's going to come within that. So it has the potential to hit a, a satellite, which would be pretty bad. But, uh, you know, you can calculate that, too, and see if it'll uh, avoid it or not and, uh, you know, take action. I'm not too sure what action would take, but uh, uh, at least we'd know in advance. And there's a couple more here that were farther out. In 2012, DA14, which was not too long ago, came really uh, close by, and I think it was visible uh, with a small telescope. All right. So... I'm almost done. Uh, looking for this, uh, we um, find other things. And it, uh, we, we just found recently two visitors from another star. So they're not aliens, at least not as far as we can tell. But there are objects, asteroids or comets, that come from a, are ejected from another star and come into the solar system. So that, this is a huge discovery. And the first one was discovered here in Hawaii. So again, using pan stars and CFHT, so you can see the pan stars image here, that faint trail there, this is it. And then when we looked at it with CFHT and we used a special observing mode, you can see here the difference between these two pictures is that here the stars are round and the asteroid is elongated. But here the stars are elongated and the asteroid is round. And here we tried to see if it had coma, if it was a comet or an asteroid. And from that picture, there's no coma. So we thought, okay, it's an asteroid. But then la later data came down and there's still a, a big discussion about the nature of that asteroid. And it's called Oumuamua. And it's, you see here, its name is right up here. And it's 1I, first interstellar. So that's the first interstellar object that was discovered. So it's a huge discovery, uh, never seen before. So we were very proud of that. Uh, here's its orbit. So you see here again, that's the orbit of the outer planet. So that's Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus. Uh, and uh, you can see how it 
is really weird. And it comes in, it goes around the sun, and it goes back out into interstellar space. It is not bound to the sun, just like unlike the other asteroids who, and the planets who have a, a circular or elliptical orbit. This one is called a hyperbolic orbit, so it's open and it's not uh, bound to the sun. So, late, uh, so here's a, a nice rendering of it that we did at the time. So we thought it was long, oblong and elongated. And now one of our scientists has reworked on the data and it, now we think it's a disk that's uh, uh, tumbling around. So don't pay attention to the red dot, that's just an artifact. But uh, this is what we think about it and now it's unobservable. It's gone, it's in the dark and we can't get to it. So there was a second one just about uh, less than six months ago that was discovered and it's called you see I here, 2i Borisov. So Borisov is the name of the guy that found it. A small telescope in Russia. And we, we ourselves, we didn't follow it up, but here's its trajectory uh, down here. And it, it's gonna be crossing uh, the solar system and then going on its way. So its orbit again is hyperbolic, but it's really open, more hyperbolic than the other. So these are very interesting findings. And here's a picture of it. So it's a comet. And now we're sure of that because this is a picture from Gemini. And you can see here that when comets approach the sun, they heat up and they, they develop a tail. And you can see that this one is developing a tail. You can see it here, it's very faint, but it's there. So this one we know uh, to be a comet. So I'll conclude here. So, you know, extraterrestrial bodies do pose a threat to Earth. And it's not a matter of when, but uh, it's not a matter of, uh, <clears throat> it's a matter of, of when we're going to be hit by a killer asteroid. So we know it's happened in the past and we know it's going to happen in the future. The thing is that we just need to know and take measures uh, to try to either deflect them or something like that. And telescopes in Hawaii are an essential part in uh, this early uh, warning system that will help NASA uh, identify and potentially eliminate, eliminate threats uh, to work. So I'll stop here. Very cool. Well, thank you so, so much for that, Daniel. That was fantastic. Um, if you could come out of screen share while we dive into Q&A, that would be fantastic. And then I will dive in with some questions. So we'll start uh, with Mr. H's class. If you guys have a question to kick us off, come on up, guys. Asteroids. Oh, yeah, you guys are muted. Okay. So Mr. H's class, Type in your questions. In the bottom of your screen, there's a little oval with three dots in it. It's a chat bar. Type them in there, and I'll pass them straight on to Daniel, okay? But your audio is not working, and I'm really sorry for that. But that way, we can take your questions, and I'll share them directly, okay? All right. Uh, let's go to Ms. Greer's group, then. If you guys have a question, come on up, guys. Wait. Yeah. Uh, okay. Are aliens actually real? <laughs> Are aliens out for real? Oh, that's a really nice question. Thank you for asking. So, astronomers very widely believe that there is alien life out there. And from, you know, the sheer number of stars and planets that we're finding right now, because something, you know, I could have talked to you about, it's another field that's uh, really interesting is planet finding. And it's another field that's really exploding. And we find them all over the place. And there's, there's several candidates that are in orbit in what we call the habitable zone. So the orbit is where water is liquid on the surface of the planet. So this is really interesting because on Earth, as soon as you find water, there's life. So... <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, what I mean by extraterrestrial life, though, I mean uh, it could be a cell. It could be cellular. It could be, it doesn't need to be the green man. So we haven't even found that yet. But astronomers are pretty sure that there is life out there in, this, in, in either the solar system or around us. <clears throat> Sorry, and we just need to find it. Uh, now, UFOs and things like that, I don't think, Many of us believe that. Uh, some people said that Oumuamua was a, an alien probe that was just floating. There's not really evidence of that. <coughs> so we're still looking, but the hopes are high that we will find life elsewhere in the universe. Outstanding. 
Um, and our question from Mr. H's class is, how does the asteroid slingshot around the sun? So you're explaining a little bit in orbits, but it's quite the, the big shift. So can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So the uh, at some point, the asteroid comes in and it, it gets attracted by the sun's gravity. And then it, it comes in and in, and the sun at some point dictates its trajectory. And depending on the angle that it comes in and the speed that it comes in, it'll slingshot at a certain angle. And this is how, you know, uh, Oumuamua did it. You could see that there were, the slingshot was uh, at a certain opening and uh, uh, Borisov uh, 2i is much more open. And that all depends on the uh, initial trajectory of the body and its, and its mass and its, initial, and its velocity too, how, and how it gets influenced by uh, uh, the sun's gravity. And it's the suns that, that influence most of its movement. The planets don't influence it much. Yeah. The sun holds something like 99% of the mass in the solar system. Uh, one of the great analogies we've used for kids before is, have you ever done one of those games you drop the coin and it spirals into the little hole in the middle? Well, the hole in the middle is like the sun in space. It makes it like a big divot in space. So if anything's kind of shooting in, it's like it goes into like a little pit. And as Daniel was saying, depending how fast it's going or what angle it's coming in at, it can be slingshot off in a variety of ways. Great question, guys. That's right. Excellent analogy, Jesse. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Mr. H's class, if you guys want to type in another, uh, please do. Ms. Fiori's class, I'm actually coming to you guys next. So you don't need to type them in here. I'll come to you and then you can ask them live. Go for it. Eight hundred buddy. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just getting into the stand here. Take your time, all good. How do the asteroids what? Form. Form. How do the asteroids form, Daniel? Oh wow, that's a really good question. Okay, so uh, for the for the guys that we get from the outer solar system. Uh, we don't really know, and that these are new, right? We only have two. In the solar system, uh, the asteroids and the comets are thought to be remnants of the formation of the solar system. So, you know, the, the, the solar system formed, the, the sun formed first, and then uh, mass accreted to form planets, and then not all the mass accreted, and the asteroids were you know, left uh, behind and didn't form a planet. So that's part of the, uh, the uh, material in the original solar system that uh, uh, didn't form into planets. So the way planets form is that there's, there's accretion of material. So uh, different asteroids just collide together and they form this bigger and bigger body. And at some point, it becomes a planet. It becomes what we call an hydrostatic equilibrium, which is, uh, it becomes round, it becomes a, a circle. However, asteroids uh, did not get enough collisions and they did not reach this equilibrium, this hydrostatic equilibrium. So they're, they're just floating out there and they're remnants of the formation of the solar system. Very cool, all right. Um, we've got her watching on YouTube now too. So Ms. Lenzner's class, uh, grade threes in Kalispell, Montana. So if you guys want to type in some questions, please do. But for now, I'm going to go to Hawaii. So Ms. Umeda's class, I'm going to take two questions from you guys. I want to make sure we get two from you because it's so nice to have a Hawaiian class in for a Hawaiian facility. So go right ahead, guys. Ask one and I'll take another in just a second. <clears throat> um, why is like the control center for the telescopes like so far away from the actual telescope? Oh, yeah. Very good question. Thank you for asking. So um, our observers used, we used to be at the summit, uh, observing at the summit every night, and many telescopes still do that. So they send people up at the summit of Mauna Kea. However, uh, there's a, one, a cost associated with that, and uh, Mauna Kea is so high that you have altitude effects. So that means that uh, you feel a little dizzy, you may have uh, uh, your, your head, uh, you may have headache. It's not really a comfortable place to work. It's, it's hard to work there. So we decided at some point in the uh, in 2010 or uh, around that, that we were gonna have our operators down here in Waimea that was uh, gonna be more comfortable for them 
and we were going to save cost because uh, cost is uh, really important uh, with observatories. We have limited budget. And so it took two years to make all the systems uh, remotely operatable, meaning that we can, let's say, turn on a light from down here at the summit and things like that. And then we decided that uh, we were going to, we, then we moved operations down here. So it's, it's mainly, you know, a comfort for the observers and uh, cost saving. That's why uh, we're operating from down here. Very cool. Thank you so much for that. I'm glad we got that question in. All right. Again, back to Ms. Humedis class. If you guys have a second one, come on up. Is Apophis going to uh, affect the Earth or the Moon in any way in 2029? Um, and if, if so, is there any way that we can intersect it or blow it up before it hits us? <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, that's a very good question. question. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, thanks. Thank you for asking. So uh, compared to the mass of, so the, the way, so to answer the first question, the way bodies are influenced, uh, the way the, gravi the motion of bodies is influenced, are influences uh, depends on the mass of the body. So the mass of Apophis is really, really small. It's really tiny compared to the mass of the Earth and the mass of the Moon. So its effect on Earth's orbit and the Moon's orbit is going to be minimal, even if it goes really small. It's going to be uh, basically zero. Now, <clears throat> deflecting it is uh, a really difficult problem. And I know that NASA is working on a few solutions <clears throat> blowing it up, uh, people do not like the idea of blowing it up because all it will do, it may not necessarily change the trajectory, but if you blow it up, it'll, it'll make several still smaller pieces, but a lot of them, and they're still dangerous. And then the, the orbit is less predictable, so you may end up causing more harm than good. Uh, so the idea is to try to deflect it using using forces uh, of some kind, a rocket, or maybe a nuclear explosion, but just at the surface, so you can steer it away from uh, a, co uh, a, co um, uh, uh, a contact with Earth. Uh, so uh, an impact, sorry, with Earth. And uh, it, it's a really difficult thing to do. Uh, we've been landing on asteroids. So you, the one thing you need to do if you want to do that, you need to land on it. And that's really difficult. But we've done it. I mean, the Japanese have done it recently. <coughs> and uh, uh, Europe also has done it uh, not too long ago on, on another satellite. That one was not, uh, the first one, the second one I, I told you about was not um, planned. It just happened. And they thought, okay, let's try to land. But this other one from the Japanese was planned it was a mission that's supposed to land and take samples. So it's happened only a couple of times. Uh, I'm not aware of any more times. It might have been a, a few more times. But this is something we're just developing. Yeah. So, and I know that NASA is planning tests for doing that. But it's a really good question. And it's an unanswered question, honestly. It's something that people are doing more research on and trying to find uh, better ways uh, to do it and develop the technology to do it. Outstanding. And there's been some great Hollywood movies about it, too. <laughs> so yeah. we need the science to catch up with the art. Um, count, yeah. All right, Daniel, we're going to take two more written-in questions, and then we're going to wrap up with that. So Ms. Lenzer's class wants to know a question that's asked to all our Space Month people. Have you been to space? Myself? No, yeah. unfortunately, I haven't. <laughs> I wish I could, but uh, no, I haven't gone to space. Yeah. I've met one astronaut, but uh, unfortunately, I haven't been there. One day. <laughs> yeah. We'll all get a chance to go. Getting, getting too many gray hairs. <laughs> uh, um, all right. And then a great question, because I love that you talked about uh, alien life and the scale of the universe. So one of our questions from Mr. H's class is, how many galaxies are out there? You don't need to give an exact number, a sense of... Oh, yeah. 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 That's a good question. There's, there's no exact numbers, but there's hundreds of billions of them. And that we know just by counting in a certain area how many we find. So there's you know billions of stars, hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, and then there's hundreds of billions of galaxies themselves with a lot of stars. 
So that's one of the reasons why astronomers are, are saying there's got to be life somewhere. Just the sheer number of stars, it's, it's, it's just probabil 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 in probability terms, it's, uh, it's very likely. It's almost one that there's life elsewhere. One of my favorite there's analogies. so many stars, and so many galaxies. Yeah, so one of my favorite analogies for classes is that there's more stars, even in our galaxy, than there are grains of sand in all the beaches of the world. So just picture that. If you go to any yeah. one beach and think of all the beaches on Earth, more stars than that. So surely one of them has something, a planet where something is growing there. So It's got to be there. Yeah, we just need to find it. Uh, Daniel, before we wrap up, this has been fantastic. Is there any last message you want to share with classes about how they can learn more, places they can go for extra resources or, or get involved? Sure, certainly. So, you know, I love my job and I have a PhD in physics and I'm an astronomer. But if you want to work in space or in observatories, you don't necessarily need to do that. Uh, to give you an idea, here at CFHT, we have 40 people that work with us full time. And we only have eight astronomers. So the other people that work here are technicians, engineers, <coughs> sorry, administrative people. There's all sorts of people that we need to get these, uh, this operation going. And uh, we, all, we need a lot of mechanical technicians, mechanical engineering, software people, software engineers, electronics engineers, all sorts of things. So... If you like astronomy and you want to contemplate uh, doing working in observatories, you don't necessarily need to have a PhD in astronomy or in physics. You, it's it's available <clears throat> to uh, jobs that uh, you know require uh, less long studies and uh, less time in school, and it's still very interesting. Yeah, marvelous, and that's been a message repeated by all our people at NASA and engineers all around the world. So I'm really happy that got brought up. Uh, Daniel, this has been really fantastic. So what we do at the end of every session, as you know, I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. And so boys and girls, if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to Daniel for joining us today, you are all now demuted. Go for it. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Uh, <laughs> we'll be sure to pass on more resources, so look for your emails in a minute. And thank you guys so much for joining us during Space Month. It means a lot. It's fantastic to have you. Daniel, that was marvelous. Thanks so much again. All right. Thank you guys for coming.